morning, everyone. Oh, my name is Benjamin Neely, I'm the executive director of the Berks History Center. It's my pleasure to welcome you all here today. Uh, thank you for coming out this morning. I just have a few announcements before we get started. Uh, we'd like to uh, announce that we've uh, we've refreshed our website. Uh, we're going to continue to work it over time, but if you go look at it, it has a new look and a new functionality, and we we hope to check it out. We we think we made it easier to register for events and to, to, to join and manage your membership. And we invite you to give us feedback whether or not we've accomplished this or not. <laughs> but uh, uh, go ahead and check it out. It's all live now. Also follow us on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube where you'll find programs like this that we've recorded and released if you, if you happen to miss it. Let's see here. Upcoming, we have on February 3rd, Amber is uh doing uh, I mispronounce this but I'm gonna do my best the Sheeran Snitta workshop if you don't know what that is it is a centuries old German paper cutting technique that creates a beautiful product with a lace-like appearance on February 10th we're gonna meet back right here at 10 o'clock for our second Saturday program for that month it's gonna be about Hessian prisoner prisoners in Pennsylvania and then we also have open, and you can register online, is the uh, Pennsylvania Dutch classes that our speaker today, Bradley Smith, teaches, along with a couple other professors. We have beginner, intermediate, and advanced classes. And so if you don't have a word of it, that's okay. We can fix that for you in the beginner's class, and we can work you right on up. So we hope you'll think about it. Don't be nervous about it. Sometimes learning a new language seems daunting, but I promise you, you can do it. Brad and help you, his team there. But, uh, also, if you're a member, we hope you are, there's a heavy discount for the uh, price for that between non-members and members. So uh, I encourage you to join if you're not and you're thinking about that class as it'll work out financially. And then we get to today's program. Today we have our uh, archivist and assistant director, Bradley Smith. He's an outstanding historian. He's been in the field for over 20 years. Uh, I think he ranks with one of the best researchers and storytellers that I know. Uh, so I'm glad to introduce him today for our program, Dr. Bado Otto, the Patriot Surgeon of Pennsylvania. Please help me welcome Bradley Smith. Thank you, Ben, and thank you to all of you for being here. This is a very interesting program because in addition to you, a very nice sized live audience in person, we also simultaneously have with us an online audience who are watching through the internet as I'm speaking to you here. I am super nervous that the technology is going to not work, but as far as I know, knock on wood, everything is working okay. Okay. All right. And I'm going to turn off my face in a moment anyway, so to the folks at home, you won't have to spit stare at my chin too much longer. Um, but it's going to require some, uh, the lecture itself will be pretty straightforward, but especially when we get to Q&A time, it's going to be an interesting new experiment because if you ask me a question from the audience, folks at home can't hear it. So what I will do, if one of you asks me a question, I'll then repeat it into the microphone so that everyone at home can hear it. And then Amber is going to be monitoring questions from the online group. So as she gets questions, she's going to tell them to me, but then I'll repeat them over here so that the folks can hear. So it's going to be, it's going to be like a juggling act. But I think it will work, and I hope it'll be a great experience. And I'm especially excited because we have members of the Bodo Auto Family Association from all over the world who are able to join us today through this experiment we're trying. So I welcome everyone here in person, and welcome our online audience, and especially welcome members of the Bodo Auto Family Association who are with us online today as well. So. If you've ever heard me talk before, you've probably heard me mention that the Berks History Center has been around a long, long time. Now, technically, for much of our history, we were known as the Historical Society of Berks County. 
In fact, that's still our legal name. We are legally the Historical Society of Berks County, but for the last 10 years, we say we are doing business as the Berks History Center. And we've been around since 1869, more than 150 years. That is a tremendously long, a tremendous long time to have been in this business. And having so much history, you've maybe heard me share this before as well. Having been in this business so long is both a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing in the sense that we were collecting artifacts and documents and books in the 1890s already, at a time when people did not think of the antiques as something to sell and make money off. So we would have the grandchildren of Revolutionary War veterans, the actual Civil War veterans who would come to our door and say, I've got this stuff, would you like it? It was an incredible time to be starting and running a historical society because there was just so much still in existence that if we were trying to start a museum today, it would just be impossible to find. That's why it's a blessing to have so much history. But it's a curse in the sense that in the 1890s, the idea of museums as a profession with professional standards just did not exist. Those standards didn't evolve until the 20th century. So when it came to things like record keeping, it's extremely hit or miss. So we also we have some fantastic artifacts for which they kept good records. We have fantastic artifacts for which we know nothing. So I'm gonna hide my picture now and give you just a few examples of this hit or miss nature of early, early museum practice here at the Berks History Center. By the way, this is an exhibit from the Berks History Center's original location on Court Street from about 1910. And I love this photograph because it shows that sort of Victorian era mindset of museum exhibits, which was no labels, no explanation, as much stuff as you can cram into a small space. During this era, the community of Reading and Berks County was excited that we were around. And we heard from all kinds of people who would come to us and say, I'd like to give you my family heirlooms. And here we have an example of a letter where someone's offering us a, a donation. And this is actually from Jay Bennett Nolan, the local historian that some of you have probably heard of. And there are a lot of interesting details in this letter from Jay Bennett Nolan to the Historical Society. For example, this letter indicates when this is happening, 1928. It tells us what the object, what the artifact, what the heirloom is being discussed a gold watch chain. It tells us where this gold watch is coming from, watch chain, from some heirs who now live in Williamsport. And it's telling us the who, Charles Evans, the, the lawyer for whom the cemetery is named, the creator of Charles Evans Cemetery. So in 1928, J. Bennett Nolan is offering us the gold watch chain of Charles Evans, attorney, founder of Charles Evans Cemetery. That's a neat, neat donation. And by the way, Jay Bennett Nolan's involvement also gives us some more background on the who. This when, what, where, and who is so important to us as museum professionals. So, so important. When you combine these, we have a word for it. We call this provenance. The when, the what, the who, the where. We call that provenance. And for this case, in this instance, this is good provenance. We can answer the who, what, when, where questions, thanks to J. Bennett Nolan's detailed letter. Sometimes the documentation is not as good. So this is a modern catalog card we created based on old records. And this is from a doll in our collection. And I just, uh, I, I have it set up so you can see little snippets, one at a time, of the catalog record for this doll, which is number 2793. 
So here is a, the first thing we do when we catalog an object and create a catalog record, which is what this is, is we create a detailed description. And the goal was to be as detailed as possible. So that way, 50 years from now, if that number 2793 gets misplaced, we can't find that attached to the object, in this case, a doll, we can find it and locate it. So if it's a doll, we might say doll with a blue dress and brown hair and red shoes. That would give me a description or maybe 16 inches long would be a good description or one arm is detached, things like that. So that way, when I see that doll on a shelf, I know, ah, this is 2793, the doll I was looking for. Here is the detailed description our predecessors left for us. Toy. The next thing we do when we catalog is we record the history. That provenance I miss mentioned, the who, the what, the when, the where. Whose doll was this? Where did they get it? What's its story? Is there something special with it? Here's the provenance they gave us. <laughs> we also like to know when it arrived. That's always very helpful. Here's the date they gave us. But we do know one thing. It was donated by a man named Raymond Sunday. And I did a little bit of looking. Oh, so there's our, there's our what, there's our when, there's our who. That's about all we know, very, very little. But I was able to find Raymond Sunday was a, in the 1916 Reading City Directory as a local piano tuner. So we know just a little tiny bit, but there's so many questions. And because we don't even know what the stall looks like, other than it looks like a toy, <laughs> There's no way I could say to Amber, our curator, Amber, could you please find this doll that she'd have nothing to, to look for? Or if she did find it, I'd have no story to tell about. It. And to us, we are in the storytelling business. We use objects like that to tell stories about our past. And there's just no story here because our predecessors didn't write it down. So this is an example of one that is, the provenance is weak, and we just can't do much with this. And part of the, this is the flip side of that long history. Today, curators and archivists are trained to carefully and meticulously document all this information. Back then, they, they just weren't trained in those practices because they had not yet been established. Here's one more example I thought I'd share. This is from our accession ledger. This one's from 1901. And the source is R.D. Griscom. That's very interesting because we as historians recognize that's Rachel Griscom, who was the first woman public school teacher in Reading in 1835. And uh, so an interesting personality. And it says per A.S. Jones. I recognize that name, too. That's Absalom Jones, who was one of our trustees in the early 1900s. But here's where the documentation falls apart. The what? Box of historic relics. Do you know how many boxes of historic relics we have down in the basement? So, so many. So there are some tantalizing hints as to what the provenance is for this, but we couldn't find it. If I said, Amber, find me a box of historic relics. And she probably asked what kind of relics, and I couldn't have any information to give her on top of that she wouldn't be able to find that. So the, I consider this provenance weak, but with hints of good provenance in there. So for example, if we found a box with a note inside saying, this is the collection from Rachel Griscom, March 12th, 1901, suddenly this jumps up to the good category. But unless we find that, this is in the weak. So they didn't label the box? Probably not, if we can find the box. By the way, this is a talk about Bodo Otto. And this is Bodo Otto's sword. And why am I telling you all about this provenance business? 
Well, this sword from Bodo Otto came to us 124 years ago, 1910. And we know this because it included a letter that came with it. It says, the sword enclosed in case used by Dr. Bodo Otto, Surgeon General in the Revolutionary Army, 1776, born 1709, died 1787. So if you think about those provenance things I'm looking for, this one paragraph is chock full of them. The what? The who? The where? The when? But on top of that, there's additional information. It tells us in the letter, this is presented by Mrs. Henry M. Otto, a family member, June 6th, 1910. So that gives us more who, more when. And this is exciting because we know who Henry M. Otto is. Henry Otto is the great grandson of Bodo Otto. And in fact, Henry Otto was born in his great grandfather's house in 1826. So if there's anyone who can, who's credible in telling us, yes, this did indeed belong to Bodo Otto, it's probably the great grandson and the, the spouse of the great grandson. So this is coming from, so at any rate, the provenance for this is excellent. Some of the best I've ever seen for our old, old donations like this. And by the way, I feel like we should give Mrs. Henry Otto her due. Mrs. Henry Otto, this was Henry Otto's second wife, Sarah Hain Otto. And we're really indebted to her because she had the foresight after her husband died to make sure this and other relics got to us. And not only that, in that era before museums knew about proper documentation, she was very specific in telling us, this is the sword, Bodo Otto, American Revolution, from my husband. She was clearly very, very wise to know how valuable that information would be to us 115 years in the future. The thing is, and this is what makes Bodo Otto and his family so interesting to us as historians. His entire family was like this. And in the early 1900s, we were getting dozens and dozens of objects from family members that they lovingly preserved, cared for, and donated, but not just box of relics, very, very specifically documented in their letters to us. It is one of the richest, best documented collections in our entire collection. And that's what led me to be so interested in Bodo Otto. By the way, they also donated, uh, in fact, it was Sarah Hain Otto, donated to us this portrait of Bodo Otto, probably done about 1755 when he was in his mid forties. That we have such great documentation for this photo auto material makes it just from the documentation standpoint, one of the best collections of relics in the, in the entire county to think. But on top of that, photo auto has an incredible, incredible story. And while this is maybe a long-winded discussion about provenance, maybe better say for a museum studies classroom, I wanted to give that background to you so you hopefully could get an understanding of just how special it is that we know so much about the man and his collection of items, which I'm gonna talk a little bit more about a bit later. But first I wanna go back to the beginning, back to the beginning of Bodo Otto's life which begins in Germany. So Bodo Otto was born in Germany and he grew up in a town called Lauterburg in what is about the center of present day Germany. At the time, Germany did not yet exist as a nation, but he grew up there in Lauterburg. And uh, his father was a man named Christopher Otto. Christopher Otto was an interesting person. He was a comptroller, which means a tax collector. And 
as a tax collector, he was someone who would have had a little bit of money and also influence. He is, was someone who knew the nobility, had connections with nobility. He married for the first time at age 43, waited a, a, till later in life to marry. His son Bodo was born the next year, and then he was widowed shortly thereafter. So for much of Bodo Otto's life as a child growing up, it was just him and his dad and at least one sister that we know of for sure. But he didn't have his birth mother in his life, though his father did remarry later. So incidentally, that's not a picture of Christopher Otto. That's a, a picture of a medieval comptroller. Just to give you an idea of what Christopher might have looked like at his job. But at any rate, an interesting thing happened in 1913. Oh, 1913. <laughs> at the age of 13, Bodo Otto became an apprentice to a local surgeon slash druggist in his area. And when he entered into this apprenticeship, it was a 12-year commitment that he was making. That to me is remarkable. Can you imagine a 13-year-old child that you know today making a 12-year life commitment that will influence the rest of their life? I, I can. And yet that's what he did. And his father helped him arrange this. And Bodo began to study medicine. And this period, this 12-year period, was about 1724 to 1736. So in other words, we're at the 300th anniversary of teenage Bodo Otto beginning his study of medicine. Now, one thing I want to point out, medicine in those days was <laughs> not as well established as it is today. Most surgery was conducted by your local barber. Barbers doubled as surgeons. And you often hear this term, if you look at the 1600s, early 1700s, this concept of the barber surgeon. And there's some Renaissance era paintings that I think sort of capture the spirit of the barber surgeon. And this is one here. And then here's another one. And uh, this one is just has so much detail that I really love. And I can you just imagine it's 1650, 1700, 1720. This is your experience at the barber shop slash doctor's office. And I love this guy. Look at his face. Uh, I wonder what they're doing to him. But I assume there's no anesthesia involved. So the fact that Bodo Otto was getting all this training already kind of set him apart. And we know a little bit about where he studied and who he studied under because Bodo Otto would talk about it. For example, he talked about serving as a, quote, surgeon's man, surgeon's man under several masters. And he studied in Hamburg and in a town called Lundberg during these years. And in 1736, he had studied enough that he was ready to take a, an exam that would certify him as a physician. And he did this at the City Hall of Lundberg, which still stands and is pictured here. And he passed his exam. And in fact, years later, one of the proctors that administered the exam commented on this. Speaking of Bodo Otto, the proctor said, he did not only well to answer his examination in 1736, but also, since that time to this day, he has sufficiently shown his ability in surgery in many particular and difficult cases. Bodo Otto married, he actually married three times in his life. 1742, he married his second wife. His first wife died very shortly after their marriage. She only lived about two years after their marriage. Then he married again to this woman, Catherine Donkin, and we have a portrait of her also given to us by the family. So 1749, Bodo Otto has now been a practicing doctor for 13 years. And he decides to return to his hometown of Lauterburg to become the chief surgeon 
of his home city. I think about this and I think this must have been a very, very happy homecoming for him. He's married to Catherine. He's now been married to her for seven years. He's got several young children at home. Going back to Lauterburg means he goes back to his dad. His father was uh, quite old at the time, but still alive. And Lauterburg was the home of the Otto family homestead, the Otto ancestral home, which historians think was built about 1650. And was this building right here? It's no longer standing. It was still standing into the 1920s, but uh, no longer exists. So the ancestral home was there. And the ancestral church where the Otto family went, the Lutheran church in Lauterburg was still two doors down. So this is for him very much a homecoming. Just to the east of Lauterburg was a beautiful mountain range, the Hartz Mountains, with a great historic site known as Sch Schartzel's Castle. And that's an image of a drawing in 1250 AD. And to the west of Lauterburg was the University of Göttingen. And it was nice for Bodo Otto having a university nearby because it's documented that he frequented the physical, anatomical, and botanical lectures of two of their eminent professors. So he's got beautiful mountain range to the east. He's got a university where he's attending lectures to the west. He's in his family homestead. His elderly father is there. He's got a, a family. He's got a great physician. He's in his hometown, his home church. It must have been a very happy time for him. But a funny thing happens. After just six years in Lauterburg, he leaves. He doesn't just leave Lauterburg, he leaves Europe and comes to Pennsylvania. And there's kind of a, it kind of raises a question. If, it seems like everything was going right for him. He was in such a happy spot. Why would he leave that? We don't know too much about the reasons, but there is one clue offered by one of his sons who noted grandfather being dead, father decided to immigrate to America. And Christopher Otto, I believe, passed away in 1752. But another motivation might have been that right about the time they were leaving, we had what we know as the French Indian War, French and Indian War, what Europeans call the Seven Years War was erupting. And I really wonder if Bodo Otto anticipated that this was going to be a difficult time for his region of Germany. And it was. There was actually warfare in the vicinity of Lauterburg. And in fact, that castle I mentioned was destroyed in 1761 in the fighting. And today, all that exists are remains, a few ruins of the castle. And that uh, postcard says, greetings from the ruins of Schartzels. There's another image of ruins. So then Bodo Otto begins a new chapter in Pennsylvania and briefly New Jersey. And this begins when they sail to America on the ship Neptune. And what's interesting is if you look at the number of ships sailing from Germany to the port of Philadelphia in the 1750s. 1754, there were 19 ships. 1755, there were two. 1756, there were one. And then several years of none. This is because of the French Indian War, completely disrupting the, it truly really was a global conflict. You could argue it was the first world war. And it just completely disrupted this whole system that included German immigration to Pennsylvania. And 1755 is when Bodo Otto came. So you can see they got in right before it shut off completely. And this is what makes me really speculate that maybe Bodo Otto was thinking he wanted to make this move before things got precarious due to the war. And we know he was on the ship because 
He's his name appears on the on the the ship's list. But also interesting, with him on the ship is a man named Reimer Lant. And that's interesting because Reimer Lant was also a doctor. And lo and behold, Reimer Lant and Bodo Otto, they arrive in Philadelphia, which at the time is one of the largest cities in North America with a vibrant economy. As one source puts it, Philadelphia was a dense urban space of brick houses and mansions small dwellings and crowded alleys, warehouses, workshops, churches, and taverns. So it was a great place to start a business if you were a merchant, a lawyer, or a doctor. Reimer Lant, that other fellow on the ship's list, was a doctor as well. And in December 1755, the German language newspaper announces Reimer Lant and Bodo Otto, who arrived from Germany in October, Give notice herewith that both of them have studied in the German universities as doctors of medicine and surgery. They now offer their services in company for all manner of curable ailments, exterior wounds, and injuries. The advertisement goes on, and I find it entertaining, so I'm going to read a little bit more from it. Those suffering from gout and rheumatism, they promise pain or promise relief from pain. Venereal disease, they will cure without torment. I know, I definitely like when my doctor does not torment me. Fractures, dislocations, cancer, eruptions, old fistulas, and all kinds of wounds will also be treated. They pledge themselves to give all an intelligent explanation of their illnesses and the medicines used. And above all, they wish to be differentiated from such doctors in the land who do not understand the nature of the illness or injury suffered by their patients or the power of the drugs they use. This is an interesting comment. They wish to differentiate themselves from other doctors. The reason for that is, remember earlier I was talking about those barber surgeons? There were still a lot of those people around. In fact, when the Revolutionary War broke out, it's estimated there were 3,500 doctors in the colonies. So they were everywhere. But the estimate is that only about 200 of those, less than 10%, were actually trained graduates of medical programs. So they are coming to Philadelphia. They're trying to establish that they are not these, I hate to say quack doctors. They're not quack doctors. They are professionally trained. And that puts them in a category that's less than 10% of the American medical practitioners who call themselves doctors. Interestingly though, Bodo didn't stay very long in Philadelphia. Shortly thereafter, he moved to a new office up the road to Germantown in that building right there. But we understand why it happened because he mentioned it in another newspaper advertisement. It simply said, Drs. Reimer Lant and Bodo Otto, because of their many patients, have found it desirable that one should live in the city and the other in the country. I think another part of this, though, as I've studied Bodo Otto, I've noticed he didn't seem to stay in one place long. About five years was maybe his maximum time he wanted to stay in one place the exception of Reading, Pennsylvania, which we'll get to later. So this is a uh, late 1700s map of Pennsylvania. I just put this on here to kind of give you an idea of where he was going. So first he's in Philadelphia, then he's in Germantown up the road, and then only after two years there, he moves to Freesburg, New Jersey. That's maybe a, a questionable move, but there's a large German-speaking population there in Friesburg, so it makes sense. While in New Jersey, his second wife, Catherine, passed away, and his three oldest children reach adulthood. And those three children, a daughter and two sons, they ended up living the rest of their adult lives in New Jersey. 
And so if you go to the local historical society in that area of New Jersey, they don't care so much about Bodo Otto, but they know a lot about those three children because they became important, prominent members of that community. But Bodo Otto moves on, he goes back to Philadelphia. And he brings with him, so his wife has passed away, his three oldest children are staying behind in New Jersey. He brings with him only his youngest son, John Otto. And he continues practicing medicine in Philadelphia. And while he's there in his second tour of duty in Philadelphia, he prints a very, very interesting advertisement in the local newspapers. And it says this, this is 1766. He says, those who, because of poverty, are, un are unable to place themselves under the care of a physician may apply to Dr. Otto and he will supply medicine and treatment with the greatest consideration. I find this fascinating because I'm not an expert in medical history, but simply put in the 1700s, I do not see people talking like this with this benevolence, with this altruism that we see in this notice from Bodo Otto, suggesting that he'd help people for the sake of helping them, not for the sake of his business. And I think that speaks volumes about the character of Bodo Otto. Stop spoot, German newspaper. So that's the English translation. Also while in Philadelphia, he married a third time in 1768 to, interestingly enough, an English woman, Margaret Parrish, and he published an article, The Utility of Vaccination. Interestingly enough, at this time in American history, smallpox was a big problem, a big problem. And there was a vaccination, more accurately, an inoculation that one could take to help not prevent smallpox, but to lessen its effects. And Americans were very, very divided on whether these vaccinations for smallpox were good or bad. Patrick Henry, who famously said, give me liberty or give me death during the American Revolution, was very much what we call an anti-vaxxer. Bodo Otto was in favor of vaccination. And in 1771, he published this article basically saying, the science is sound, please vaccinate for smallpox if you think this is a, a concern for you. So it's the, the arguments in 1771 are so similar to the arguments I've heard in 2021. It's, it's history repeating itself in such an obvious way, it's fascinating. But this article will, I don't wanna say come back to haunt Bodo Otto, it will come into play a few years later. So keep that in mind. So he's in Philadelphia about six years. And remember I said Bodo Otto didn't like to stay put too long. So then he moves to Reading, Pennsylvania, about 1773. By the way, I just wanted to point out, if you follow the road going out of Reading a little bit, you see Hamburg to the north and to the east. You see that town C-O-O-T-T-S, or C-O-O-T-S-S-T, that's Kutztown. But they spelled there like Coots, Coots T, the abbreviated town. So he didn't go to Coots Town, but he did go to Reading in 1773. And he brought his son, John Otto, with him. John was about 22 years old. John Otto, that son, would then become the patriarch of all the Berks County Ottos, of which there were many, while the other kids were still in New Jersey, and that's where their family would, would really make a name for themselves. Incidentally, this is an image from our museum collection. This is allegedly the earliest image of Reading, Pennsylvania known to exist. So it might give you an idea of what it looked like when Bodo was here. But just to also, Add to that illustration, I found an early quote 
that describes the reading that Bodo Otto was moving himself into. <laughs> Reading is a considerable but ill-looking town with one-story log houses, small, slovenly, and inconvenient, with a few modern buildings clumsily ornamented. So you might think, why is Bodo Otto moving to Reading? You think about it, Reading in 1773 is only about 25 years old. It's a young town, but there's a large German population that that's Bodo Otto's background, and being sort of on the frontier, so to speak, there are not as many doctors, there is less competition for him and his son. Incidentally, his son, John, and his other sons, Frederick and Bodo Jr., all became doctors. So they open an apothecary shop and doctor's office on Penn Street, right next to one of the market houses which actually, as I think about it, that market house would not have been built yet, but where today is, or, or later was a market house. But uh, if you've ever gone upstairs to look at our Reading model on the second floor, Bodo Otto's house is actually shown on that model right here, the one I'm highlighting in yellow. According to the model, that's where Bodo Otto lived, and that's, that seems to be accurate. So 1773, he and his son established their doctor's office and apothecary there. In the 500 block of Penn Street. Incidentally, if you have really good eyes or a magnifying glass, and you look closely at that Bodo Otto house on the model, you can see this sign, Dr. Bodo Otto. And that word there, I don't even want to try to pronounce it, but it's an archaic form of the word surgery or surgeon. That sign is about the size of a dime in real life. <laughs> Incidentally, the home is no longer standing, but there is a historical marker uh, on Penn Square that indicates that it was there. So at any rate, I want to talk next about Bodo Otto's military service. Oh, interesting. The markers are at the wrong location. They're not positioned properly on Penn Street. So I'm going to move fast forward to 1776. Bodo Otto has now been in Reading about three years. 1776, things are getting a little crazy in North America, in the British colonies of North America. January of 1776, this fellow Thomas Paine publishes Common Sense in Philadelphia, arguing that Americans should become an independent nation. March of 1776, the British begin a full blockade of American ports. In June of 1776, a committee of the Continental Congress, which is in session of Philadelphia, begins drafting a Declaration of Independence. We know about a lot of these things from the days of elementary school, but there were a lot of other complex political events happening in North America at the time and in Pennsylvania. And one, perhaps the most important political event that nobody's ever heard of, June 1776, Pennsylvania held an event called the Pennsylvania Provincial Conference. And this was a conference that was meant to determine, basically the, the point of the conference was this, they realized we are heading toward revolution. And Pennsylvania is a British colony. How do we make the transition from British colony to Commonwealth, to state of these new United States, which are about to form a new union? The conference was to figure that out, figure out what a state constitution for Pennsylvania might look like, and figure out if there is war, which seems inevitable at this point, 
how do we, how does Pennsylvania form militia units that will serve in this war? Bodo Otto was elected by the people of Berks County to be one of our representatives at this important conference. And I think that also speaks to the fact that within just three years, he had established himself as a trusted member of the community. Otherwise, they would have picked somebody else to go. A few weeks later, independence is declared, and suddenly, Bodo Otto finds himself in the new army of the United States. And he indicates at the beginning of the war, I was chosen surgeon of the battalion of the flying camp troops by the committee of inspection of Berks County. So this is interesting. So this is 1776. There are a couple of interesting things about this. One is that Bodo Otto is indicating he's entering military service. He is 65 years old at this point. A lot of people could have said, I've done my dues. I'm retired. I'm going to just sort of be coasting, like taking fewer patients at the doctor's office, coasting to retirement. Not Bodo Otto. He served. He served. And incidentally, flying camp troops were an interesting idea. The thought was they would be sort of this very mobile, almost like a reserve force that could be plugged in efficiently wherever it was needed. It didn't quite work out. It didn't quite work out. They never really, it just was not a well-managed, it was a good idea that wasn't executed very well, wasn't managed well. But at any rate, August 26, 1776, just two months after he had been in Philadelphia at that provincial conference, Bodo Otto finds himself in the midst of the Battle of Long Island. And I think the Battle of Long Island is one of the more important battles of the Revolutionary War that a lot of people don't know. And I think that's because it was a bad outcome for the United States. Therefore, we don't tend to focus on that like we do other battles. And I put together a few little slides to just kind of give you the basic gist of where things went wrong with the battle. So at the time, the United States Army under George Washington is on the island of Manhattan, which is a much, much different looking place in that time period. And Washington decides he wants to move his forces up to Brooklyn Heights. So they cross the river, they, they go into Brooklyn, and they are certain the British are coming. And the British at this time, point have the largest army, the largest Navy in the entire world. This is a scary time for these soldiers here in Brooklyn. They know the biggest military force on the planet is coming for them. And this is a ragtag group of farmers, blacksmiths, lawyers, and in Bodo Otto's case, doctors. It must have been so scary for them, knowing what was coming, knowing how weak and how ill-prepared they were, but they were there, ready to serve. So they move into Brooklyn and take fortified positions. Sure enough, the British comes with multiple boats and they deploy a large force. The Americans had about 9,000 soldiers on, in Brooklyn. The British had about 20,000. So you're outnumbered by the strongest, best trained military in the world, more than two to one. And then the British take some of their force and slide them around the side and position themselves to being on the verge of flanking the American forces who are now basically trapped between an army twice their size and a river. This is looking bad. This is looking bad for the Americans. But they, they're entrenched, they're at least fortified, and they make a decision. We have to get out of here or we're going to get destroyed. But if the British see us leaving, they're going to just pounce on us. So we have to do it secretly. So what they did in the middle of the night, basically, they start preparing to evacuate. And they evacuate back to Manhattan. The last boat of soldiers leaving about seven in the morning. 
They wanted to be done before it became daylight, but fortunately it was a very foggy morning, so they were able to do it without the British detecting them. This is an interesting moment in history. If the British catch them doing this, or if the British just would have attacked with greater relentlessness, the American army would have been trapped and entirely destroyed. The United States could have ended two months after it began at this point. So that escape to Manhattan was huge. And Bodo Otto was there for all of it. And he commented one time on it, just one sentence, boy, if I could build a time machine, I would go back and ask him, what happened at Long Island? What was your experience? And incidentally, they were so secretive. Washington gave the order that they were to wrap the wheels of the cannons so that they wouldn't be so creaky and no one was allowed to talk. No one was allowed to talk. And they did it. They snuck out and made it to Manhattan. But Bodo Otto in the experience said this, in the unexpected attack of the enemy at Long Island, our troops retired in great haste and I lost all my medicines and instruments. After that, Bodo Otto was given a new position. Instead of being in a combat situation, he was sent to run a military hospital uh, in a location known as the Bettering House. This is kind of like a Philadelphia version of the Berks County Alms House, but they were using it as a military hospital and Bodo Otto was appointed senior surgeon there. And at the Bettering House, we know that one of the big problems they encountered was smallpox. Remember I mentioned smallpox earlier? It was such a, a big problem. So smallpox is a big problem here. And we know in part about this because one day John Adams visits the Bettering House. John Adams, future president of the United States, founding father. John Adams would have certainly interacted with Bodo Otto on his visit to the Bettering House. But here's what John Adams said about the situation there while Bodo Otto was senior surgeon. He said, the graves of the soldiers, dead of the smallpox and camp diseases are enough to make the heart of stone to melt away. The sexton told me that upwards of 2000 soldiers had been buried there. Disease has destroyed 10 men for us where the sword of the enemy has killed one. I never in my whole life was affected with so much melancholy. So this is a bad situation. And it highlights an interesting reality about revolutionary war medicine and the war in general. This is the era before we understand about germs and bacteria and things like that. And disease was a huge problem. John Adams is not wrong in highlighting the problems of disease. And for Bodo Otto, you might think he's gotten off the front lines. It's safer for him now. Probably the opposite was true. Probably now he's dealing with sick and wounded soldiers every day. He's probably now gone into a more dangerous situation, being exposed to all this illness. The same week that John Adams made this comment, George Washington made a decision. He said the following, finding the smallpox to be spreading much and fearing that no precaution can prevent it from ruining the whole of our army, I have determined that the troops shall be inoculated. Pretty bold. He just said, we're doing it. That's it. Patrick Henry, I know you don't like it. We're doing it. We're doing it. The thing is, they needed someone to lead this effort. Someone who knew about smallpox, someone who knew about inoculation, maybe someone even who's already published on vaccines, like Bodo Otto. And lo and behold, William Shippen, the director of hospitals, notes in February 1777, General Washington has directed that all the Continental troops shall be inoculated. I have therefore sent Dr. Otto to Trenton upon this business, as well as to take charge of the military hospital at that place. 
So the hospital at Trenton was being run out of military barracks that were there and which still exist to this day. One of the few places where Bodo Auto served that's still standing. And this is today a museum that you can visit. And the website for the Trenton Barracks Museum notes that they did indeed have this inoculation station basically set up here. It was led by Bodo Otto. And in the words of the Trenton Barracks Museum, this was the first mass medical treatment in the Western Hemisphere. And our Bodo Otto from Reading was in charge of it. Pretty incredible, pretty incredible. <clears throat> this is just, a, this is actually a photograph of an exhibit at Valley Forge sewing a soldier being inoculated for uh, against smallpox. So this is, imagine this scene playing itself out thousands of times over at Trenton. And that's, that's what the scene would have looked like. Well, I have not seen evidence of that. Yes. But we can get more into that in the Q&A. So bring that up again, if you would. I should say I've seen that written in secondary sources and sources published in 1880 and 1890. I've not seen it in the records of 1770 and 1780. So, but uh, keep that thought in mind. We'll talk about that some more. Uh, at Trenton, uh, two of uh, Bodo Otto's sons, Frederick Otto and John Otto, joined him as surgeon's mates. So it was kind of a family affair involved in this process of inoculations. But they weren't just vaccinating soldiers. They also had a lot of wounded and sick there as well. By the way, this fellow, Benjamin Rush, a founding father and the first Surgeon General of the United States, he visited Bodo Otto at Trenton. He said the following. In the latter end of August or beginning of September 1777, I visited the hospital at Trenton, then under the care of Dr. Otto. I found the rooms clean and everything as far as it related to Dr. Otto in good order. I had the highest opinion of Dr. Otto's probity, as well as his industry and humanity to his profession. While Bodo Otto is at Trenton, we have three battles, the Battle of Brandywine, the Battle of Paoli, and the Battle of Germantown. And what that means is more wounded soldiers, more sick soldiers. So we know that aside from the inoculations, Bodo Otto actually had his hands full. In fact, one report from November 24th, 1777, tells us that they had 112 sick and 102 convalescing at Trenton. And about the same time, the British occupied Philadelphia. And this is a big deal. This is a very big deal because Philadelphia was their capital. So all the founding fathers evacuate. Some of the city leaders evacuate. We actually had a second Saturday program recently on this topic that the leadership of Philadelphia basically evacuates. The British are in charge. And Trenton is just over the river from this. So eventually the Continental Army, including Bodo Otto, they evacuate Trenton as well. And Bodo Otto gets sent to the military hospitals at Bethlehem in December, 1777. Now Bethlehem, we had uh, this building, which was uh, a dormitory owned by the Moravian church. This was a hospital, but as far as we know, Bodo Otto did his work in a converted grist mill which is no longer standing, but you can see in this photograph. While Bodo Otto is in Bethlehem, George Washington begins the encampment at Valley Forge, December 1777. And this map shows the British have, are in Philadelphia. They've taken Philadelphia. Washington is at Valley Forge. And it's really a, a very strategic location that Washington has selected because it 
he's far enough away, the British can't make a quick strike at him, but he's close enough that he can keep an eye on them and help protect the countryside, help protect folks in Lancaster, in Reading, in communities like that. So it's a good sort of, a good place for him to be keeping an eye on the British army. George Washington's army lacks the strength in many cases to just take the British head on and kick them out of Philadelphia. He can't just go in there and, and kick them out. His army's not strong enough. But he can, by positioning himself there strategically, serve as a deterrent to contain them. Plus this gives him and his troops access to the countryside and the food and the clothing and the resources that the countryside could offer them. A lot of people know about Valley Forge. What they don't know is just a few miles down the road was a health resort, Yellow Springs. And this became the primary military hospital for Valley Forge. And it made sense they'd make the hospital a little bit beyond the encampment because that means if the British would come up there after them, the sick and wounded are a little bit protected. They have a little bit of a buffer, but they're close enough that they can go back and forth between Yellow Springs and Valley Forge quite easily. And interestingly enough, something very unique happened at, at Yellow Springs. They built a building called Washington Hall, shown in this picture, specifically as a military hospital. We had lots of military hospitals in the Revolutionary War, but mostly they were churches and betterment houses and barracks and places like that that were makeshift hospitals. This is, as far as I know, the only building designed and built specifically from the start as a military hospital for the American Revolution. And we know quite a bit about this because records survive that tell us about this building. For example, we know on the first floor, there were two large wards. On the second floor, there were many small rooms. And on the ground floor, there were kitchen and dining spaces. We also know, by the way, that this no longer stands, but the foundation is still there. And there you can see how it looks on the foundation. Is that the foundation you were thinking of? So I think it's the actual Washington Hall then. Yeah. Mm hmm So Bodo Otto arrived at Yellow Springs in mid-1778, and he stayed for three and a half years, which is basically longer than any other post he held, well, actually longer than all other posts combined he held during the revolution. He was here at Yellow Springs quite a long time. All three of his sons also ex spent uh, time here to some extent, assisting him. We know a lot, well, I've, I've often said there, there's so many stories about Bodo Otto. And my attitude is, I want to make sure that the stories I tell about him come from sources from the 1700s, not the 1800s or 1900s. Because in the 1700s, he was there, people were there, and we, we, those are what we call primary sources or firsthand accounts. And one of the best firsthand accounts, or I should say series of firsthand accounts, we have of Bodo Otto come from this guy, Reverend James Sprout. James Sprout was a, a Presbyterian minister who was a chaplain who traveled around the Revolutionary War hospitals in Pennsylvania. And he kept notes about where he was and what he was doing and who he was talking to. And he often talks about Bodo Otto. So, for example, June 12, 1778, he says, rode to Yellow Springs, visited Dr. Otto. After dinner, preached in the hospital. Tis airy and new, but not yet finished. Smoked a pipe and then preached to a number in adjacent bar. Many sick here, though clean and airy. Incidentally, I'm always entertained by his entries because he'll say something really significant 
And then the next sentence will say, smoke the pipe. It just, uh, it, it makes me laugh. September 14th, 1778, he notes, old Dr. Otto behaved politely. October 13th, 1778, preached at Yellow Springs, 115 sick and 16 guards. September 27th, 1779, rode to Yellow Springs, dined with Dr. Otto Sr., preached in the afternoon. The hospitals are well provided for and the gentlemen take good care of the sick. So when he's talking about the gentlemen, he's talking about Bodo Otto and his sons. So notice there's a theme here. Whenever people interact with Bodo Otto, they tend to say good things. He runs a, a tight ship. He runs a good hospital. October 12, 1780, dined with the young doctors Otto, lodged with the old doctor. He always calls him the old doctor. It makes me laugh. But he was old. He was, at this point, 69 years old. I should say old for military service. One of the big, big questions that to me has been so fascinating and vexing and which I spend way too much time trying to solve is when exactly did Bodo Otto arrive at Yellow Springs? As I mentioned before, it all comes down to what do the primary sources, what do the firsthand accounts from the 1700s tell us? That's what I try and base my answer on. We know a few facts, but there are some glaring omissions. So for example, we know the first week of April, 1778, he was still up in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. We know that for a fact. We know by the last week of May, 1778, he was definitely at Yellow Springs. That's a fact. But we've got two periods. Purple, the purple, May, 1778, he's probably at Yellow Springs, but I can't prove it. And the yellow, the later half of April, I just don't know. I don't know where he's at. But here's why. Here's some of the sources that, that give me the information. So I know April 4th, the minister, Reverend Sprout, says Bodo Otto's in Bethlehem. Old, old Dr. Otto's at Bethlehem. So he's definitely there on the 4th of April. He also says that on May 2nd, Bethlehem was vacated, that Bethlehem had been closed down. In fact, that was a decision made a month earlier that they were going to close down the hospital there. On May 2nd, Reverend Sprout says, Bethlehem is basically cleared out except for a few stragglers who are really sick. My assumption is that Bodo Otto would have been gone by then because he's too important to be sticking around for a few stragglers. They need to employ him where the need is greatest. So I'm pretty sure by May 2nd, he's already been at Yellow Springs for some time. But I can't prove it. It's only an assumption. But we know for sure May 26th, he's definitely at Yellow Springs because there are records that tell us he is there on May 26th. Two other dates of interest I want to mention. June 17th, the man named Samuel Kennedy dies at Yellow Springs. And that's important because Samuel Kennedy was the was a doctor. He owned Yellow Springs, and it was basically his site, his hospital. When Bodo Otto was sent down there, be it in April or May, 1778, Kennedy was the guy in charge because it was his own, literally. Kennedy had been there first. But we also know that Kennedy got very sick. And throughout the month, of the first two weeks of June, Reverend Sprout, for example, is talking about how sick Kennedy is. And in one of his longer diary entries, it's actually kind of moving. He talks about how he has this very existential conversation with a dying Dr. Kennedy at Yellow Springs. Mm -hmm. But at any rate, so that's important, though, because once June 17th comes around, Bodo Otto is clearly in charge at Yellow Springs. And from that point on, he's the head guy. Two days later, June 19th, 
the bulk of the Continental Army leaves Valley Forge. However, there were still a lot of sick and wounded there. So there was still a military presence there, but the bulk of the army leaves. They are on their way to New Jersey where the Battle of Monmouth is gonna be fought. So you might ask, why do I care so much? I'm, I've, I've got it, the window narrowed down to about eight weeks. Why do I care so much? Well, there are a couple of reasons. One is, as one of, one of the folks in our in-person audience mentioned, there is a tradition that Bodo Otto was a personal physician to George Washington at Valley Forge. I want that to be true so badly. <laughs> but I just haven't found the primary source evidence of it. But if it happened, it's gonna be sometime after April 4th, when we know photo autos in April, and before June 19th when Washington leaves. That's our window. Now, one thing we do know for certain, May 13th was a momentous day at Yellow Springs because Washington came from Valley Forge and visited the hospital. And not a quick visit, like when Josh Shapiro goes to the farm show with the news cameras, but a long visit, a visit where he spent the whole day there. Almost certainly, Bodo Ada was there with him that day and interacting with him and talking with him. And here's something we know about that visit. One of the doctors that was also there wrote, his, excellent, his excellency went out to the Yellow Springs two days ago to visit the hospitals and found them in fine order. He spoke to every person in their bunks, which exceedingly pleased the sick. He was highly pleased to find the hospitals in such order. Now at this point, Samuel Kennedy and Bodo Otto are working together with the hospital, but yet again, Another person praising the well-run hospitals associated with Photo Autumn, including George Washington. That's the guy I want writing my letter of recommendation. <laughs> and at the very least, Photo Auto got the best endorsement you can get <laughs> during the American Revolution. So there's still a lot of mysteries. Was Photo Auto here? Almost certainly almost certainly on this day. To what extent was he a personal physician of George Washington, as the legend suggests? We just don't know. But I'll tell you this, if there's a document out there that proves it, I will find it. <laughs> and then we'll have to have another uh, a follow-up program. I'm, I'm looking, trust me. But I wanted to point out, working at Yellow Springs was challenging. There were a lot of challenges. One, lack of supplies. Bodo Otto on a monthly basis was writing to the Continental Congress saying, I have no bedding, I have no medicines, I have no rations. We are so undersupplied, please help. These soldiers are already sick and dying. You gotta take care of these guys. And this is a very common theme you see in Bodo Otto's writings. Another problem is that folks weren't getting paid. These doctors and nurses working at these hospitals were working and working and working. And there was no Fair Labor Standards Act back then. They sort of had a vague expectation that someday they'd get paid, but it just wasn't happening. But this was a source of frustration. And we know this because Bodo Otto talked about that as well. 1780, he says the following, the physicians complain daily they have not received any money for the services these seven months. The nurses and orderlies refuse serving any longer as they receive no pay. Here's something interesting. So he's complaining, I can't prove it, but I think what happened is that I think Bodo Otto paid these people out of his own pocket. And there's some evidence of this. One is that when the war ended, the Continental Army, uh, the Continental Congress owed Bodo Otto so much money, so much money. What, what was all this money? I think it's 
reimbursing him for paying these people out of his pocket. And the other, and now, now that's just circumstantial evidence, but the other circumstantial evidence is they never did leave. They never left. So I think, I think Bodo Otto paid them out of his own pocket, which is incredible. And by the way, now Bodo Otto is almost 70 years old. He's serving his country. He's in danger every day from the illness he's encountering. He's not wealthy by any means. He's comfortable, but he's not wealthy by any means. And I think he, he did this, which is incredible. Had he not done this, these doctors and nurses go home, who suffers? The sick and the wounded men who were literally laying down their lives for the United States. It's pretty incredible when you think about it, if my assumption is correct. This is another illustration from the Valley Forge Visitor Center showing what an interior of a Revolutionary War hospital might have looked like. It was not a real <laughs> hospitable place, not like going to uh, Tower Health, Reading Hospital or St. Joe's today. And it highlights the third problem. Staff were getting sick. Remember earlier I mentioned that it was almost more dangerous in a hospital than on the battlefield. There is evidence of this over and over and over again. For example, when Bodo Otto was in Bethlehem in January 1778, five nurses died in a single month from illnesses they contracted from their patients. I mentioned Dr. Samuel Kennedy, the man who set up Yellow Springs. He died, I mentioned he died, and that's when Bodo Otto took over. But the description of his death, malignant putrid fever, that sounds terrible. No. That sounds terrible. I'm glad I didn't, I'm glad I live when I live. Bodo Otto's own son, Dr. John Otto, living at Yellow Springs, got very sick. They described his illness as violent fever. It was so bad, they sent him home to Reading, not sure if he was going to survive. He did, fortunately, or we might not be having this talk because I wouldn't know about all this stuff. But he, it was touch and go for a while. And Bodo Otto Jr., his other son, died age 33 due to pulmonary consumption, in other words, tuberculosis. Now, that's an, there's another family legend with him that he was traveling and trying to get somewhere, and it was raining, and he caught pneumonia and died. But other sources seem to suggest it was more likely tuberculosis that he may have contracted while working in a military hospital. The point is, this was a dangerous place to be. It was a dangerous place to be. Illness was more of a threat than bullets. So September 1781, the United States on the verge of a decisive victory in the Battle of Yorktown, which played out over a few weeks in September and October 1781. So things are looking pretty good. And in that same month, a congressional committee, a committee of the Continental Congress, ordered the closing of Yellow Springs with remaining patients to be sent to Philadelphia. And Bodo Otto, now age 70, was discharged in January 1782. Now, we know Bodo Otto didn't have any money at this point, so he's got to keep working. Interestingly enough, he went briefly to Philadelphia and briefly to Baltimore, maybe to sort of explore the possibility of, of setting up a practice there. But he came back to Reading, where his son John was recovering nicely from his violent fever. And they returned to their office and apothecary shop on Penn Square in Reading. And we know this in 1784. They put out an advertisement. There was no newspaper in Reading at the time. So they advertised this in Philadelphia newspapers. Dr. Bodo Otto and his son announced to the public and to their good city and country friends who've honored them with their patronage 
that the apothecary shop is now well supplied, a fresh stock of good medicines and other necessities. They ask their patrons to visit them and give an assurance that they will be served at the lowest prices and with the greatest care. Three years later, Bodo Otto died in 1787. He's interred at Trinity Lutheran Church here in Reading, just a few blocks from us. And his son, John Otto, continued the medical practice and continued for the rest of his life. And then John's son, John Otto Jr., Bodo's grandson, continued the practice. And he was still operating as a doctor in that same office on Penn Street until his death in 1858. In other words, the Otto family was practicing medicine here before the Revolutionary War, and they were here up until three years before the Revolutionary War, uh, up to three years before the Civil War, I'm sorry. So from the Revolutionary War to the Civil War, they were here on Penn Square practicing medicine. And interestingly enough, do you remember early in the talk, I talked about that sword which came from Mrs. Henry, Muhlenberg, or Henry Otto? This is Henry Otto's father. So while John Otto, Bodo's grandson, is here in the, the old home and office, that's where Henry Otto is growing up, the man who would later, through his wife, donate to the Burke's History Center. So it's a very clean paper trail going from Bodo Otto to us. So Bodo Otto, or John Otto, when he died in 1858, the family held on to the property until 1876, and an announcement appeared in local papers that there was going to be an orphan's court sale, the late property of John B. Otto, deceased, Bodo's grandson. On the north side of Penn Street, number 525, and there's something fascinating in this notice. They note all that certain three-story brick house now, remember I talked about that model of the city of Reading. That was built as a Works Progress Administration project in the 1930s during the Great Depression. And I've often wondered, how did they know what those houses should even look like? But they apparently got Bodo Otto's house right. All that certain three-story brick house, I see a three-story brick house. Mm -hmm. So that's accurate, actually a pretty accurate depiction mm -hmm. of the home. So it was sold in 1876 and was bought by Earl's Wallpaper and Paper Store. Yes. And eventually the uh, auto house was torn down. It was replaced by this building by at least 1891, which is when this photograph was taken. So the house is gone, the, the house in doctor's office slash apothecary shop, but we still have so many of these items I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, the items that the family has given to the Burke's History Center over the years. And just to mention a few, we have the family Bible given to Bodo Otto by his wife in 1769. Now, what's interesting about this, this is from his third wife, who was English, but it's a German language Bible with some notes written by Bodo inside in German. We have Bodo Otto's Revolutionary War era decanter set because... If you are dealing with all this death and sickness, you probably will need brandy. <laughs> and this is an incredible, this is absolutely a work of art, this set. And again, remember I talked about that word provenance, the who, what, where, when, for every one of these items, the Bible, the brandy set, the paper trail is so clean and so complete because the family had the foresight to know we should be detailed when we're giving these items and explaining the background. We have many of his surgeon tools. 
And again, the provenance is very good. Very good, very good, very good, very good, very good. For all these items, the provenance is excellent. Just to give you an idea of how good the provenance is, when Bodo Otto died, an estate inventory was made of his property on Penn Street. And this, this inventory lists everything in his house, basically. We can actually tie items from that inventory to the items that are here in the History Center today. So for example, the inventory mentions a case of surgeon instruments. We've got that. Now it's only empty in this photograph because those instruments are on display. They include things like scalpel, amputation knife, and an amputation saw, which you can see on display on the second floor. Once again, I'm gonna repeat that I'm glad I live when I live, when I see medical instruments like that. The estate inventory also mentions one velvet book with medical instruments also, and we have that book. So just the provenance is just incredible. It's like nothing I've ever seen with the collection, how clean everything lines up with the paper trails and the documentation. We have the sword, which I mentioned earlier, and an interesting thing with the sword, there are actually three different theories as to where the sword came from, how it got into Bodo Otto's hands, and it depends on which side of the Bodo Otto family you talk to. One version is it was carried by Bodo Otto. He had it with him. Another is that we know that there were times where he would treat enemy soldiers, including Hessians. There's a, a legend that a Hessian soldier, as thanks, gave the sword to Bodo Otto for treating him with fairness and not looking at him as an enemy. The third theory is that Bodo Otto, early in his career while he was still in Germany, served as a surgeon for a troop of dragoons, that's 1700s cavalry, and that these dragoons gave him that sword as a gift, or he carried the sword when he was interacting with them, just to feel a little more military-like. Interestingly enough, there was a historian who talked about this, and he said, whatever it is, it's not the first one, because doctors never carried swords in the American Revolution. Well, we did a little homework on this. We reached out to a sword expert used by people like the Smithsonian. And he looked at the sword and he said, this is a sword made in France, made about 1770 and popular amongst American military people. Based on his expert opinion, we think that this is a sword that Bodo Otto himself acquired and carried with him even though it wasn't typical for doctors to carry a sword with them, the belief is that this was actually his, not something that he received as a gift and stuck in a bookcase, but that he would have actually had at his side during the Revolutionary War, based on the opinion of this nationally known expert. So number one seems to be the winning theory, because it's too new to be from the Dragoons, and not quite the right region to be from a Hessian soldier. And we have the portraits and manuscripts and much, much more. It really is amazing that all this material survived with so much good history. And I've got to say, as I've gotten to study Bodo Otto, I'm so impressed with him. Everywhere he went, people spoke highly of him. Everywhere he went, it seems like he wasn't in it for the money. He wasn't in it for the glory. He wanted to do the right thing. He wanted to serve his country. He wanted to serve people. Like that advertisement in 1766 where he said, if you're poor and you can't afford medical treatment, come see me. Like 17. 80, when his staff is on the verge of walking out because they aren't getting paid, 
then suddenly they all stay and he's got a huge debt owed to him by the Continental Congress. And he seemingly paid them off. He's someone who did extraordinary things and did extraordinary good in a difficult, difficult time. I, for one, considered it an honor that we can be the keeper of this collection of wonderful relics and the keeper of this great, great story. That's my program. Thank you very much.